We live by numbers. We track and count and measure everything. And sometimes we think the only numbers that really matter are the big ones. But it's the single digits that make the difference. The Bible says that heaven rejoices with the number one. Yeah, heaven rejoices each time even one person comes to know Jesus. But a daily focus on one meaningful interaction for Christ, that's the true difference maker. One friend, one family member, one coworker, one person at a time. We want to see God move in our nation like we have never seen before, but it all starts with one. Who's your one? Hey, well, good morning again, and uh, welcome here to Central Baptist Church. And a lot of folks are joining us live streaming, live Facebook out in the refuge service. So, so glad you're here. If you've got a Bible with you this morning, I invite you to take it. And let's turn to the uh, Gospel of Luke. This morning, we're going to be in Luke uh, chapter 16. And uh, we're beginning a brand new series, uh, which is called Who's Your One? Now, many of you have heard this before because some of you have been here a long time. You kind of know my story. Uh, Angie and I got married in 1988. She was teaching school in Madison, which is outside of Fort City. I was got a job working at the co-op, Farmer Supply. If you live in Arkansas, the rural area, you're pretty familiar uh, around. And then later, I got a call to uh, come to the Farmer Supply Co-op there in Wynn, Arkansas at Cross County uh, Farmers Association. And there, the manager there, his name was uh, J.L. Campbell. And he had a couple sons, but one of the sons that lived there and also worked at co-op, his name was David. Now, if I can remember this, uh, yeah, it was a long time ago. If I remember it exactly, I, I go in for the interview with Mr. Campbell and all that stuff. We talk about everything. I, I get the position. And pretty well, it was either as soon as I walk out of the office or like the first day I showed up to work, uh, his son, David Campbell, came up to him. David's a little bit taller, man. He walks up to me. He's like, hey, man. I'm like, hey, you're David. Yeah. He said, uh. I want you to come to church with me. Now, many of you know my testimony. I, you know, professed that, uh, you know, I knew about Christ, but I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I was like, hey, uh, yeah, we may check that out. Angie's still teaching school in Madison. He's like, no, man, I want you to come to my Sunday school class too. This is like the first day. And he's like this tall, and he said, I want you to come to Sunday school with me. Now, Sunday school, we called it Sunday because it started out as school kind of on Sunday and teaching of the Bible and Ours are called life groups. We meet all through the week. So, but, you know, some of you grew up in the church. And you're saying Sunday school. I said, yeah, I don't know. You know, we don't know. He said, it's a way she'll get to know people. And probably every day from that moment on that I saw David Campbell, he's like, I want you to come to Sunday school with me. And I couldn't remember telling uh, Angie this. I said, you know, I said, this dude is wearing me out. I said, he's wearing me out. I said, I didn't think there's a man that could beat me down like this, but he is beating me down emotionally. You know, whatever. I said, I said, you know what? And he said, well, we need to be going to church anyway. I said, and this was like, and I started in the summer, it's like a fall. And so uh, I, I, I told him, I said, okay, look, we're going to come to Sunday school with you. Now, they had one co-ed class at that time taught by a farmer named Tommy Owens. And I knew some of the guys in there. Angie was teaching school, though, not from that area. And she was driving back and forth. And uh, so she didn't know a lot of people. And uh, now here's what happened. It's a wonder I got saved anyway, because they probably did everything you could possibly do wrong in that class, like to run me off. For example, not the teacher. He's a good friend of mine. I'm just talking about guys. So when we, I've told this story before, we approach the door. When the door comes open, I look, the men are sitting in the back. Nobody says amen, did they? And the women were sitting in the front. And so the door comes open. Here's what you don't do in a life group. I mean, you're supposed to say, hey, my name is Archie. We're so glad you're here. Come on in. You'll be nice. There's some guy in the back goes, hey. He screams across the room. Everybody looks at me and Angie and Doyle. He says, hey, Archie, Archie, hey, you may curse that in the front. You come back here with the men. You don't do stuff like that, okay? Hey, when he said that, Angie grabbed my hand. You know, and she looked at me, and I just said, yes, ma'am, which meant I'm sitting with you on the front. We sat down on the front. They are heckling me from the back. I'm not even saved. I'm not born again. They're heck. It's a wonder I got saved. That's why I say that. And so uh, uh, now what happened with Dave? You say, well, what's the big deal with that? Well, you know the rest of the story. Man, God saved me. Well, how did that all start? Because there was a man named David that really wouldn't take no for an answer. And... He was very nice and whatever, but every time I'd see him, he'd smile. He'd start walking to me. I'm like, I know you're fixing to invite me to Sunday school. Please don't invite me to Sunday school. He's like, hey. And here we are all these years later. I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for a man who I, I guess you can say I kind of like became his one. He, 
through the power of the Holy Spirit, he stayed after me. And the rest is history. You know, that's the series. Like, who's your one? Who's one person that God brings to mind that could be a family member, friend, an acquaintance? Maybe it's someone at work. Whether you sit in the car and they bring your groceries to you or you go in and get them. How that works now. That's so cool, by the way. You know, but how that works. Maybe it's someone you've met and you don't know. They... You don't know if they have a church home. But maybe they've never said anything to you about church. And, and, uh, but it's maybe someone the Holy Spirit's kind of put on your mind about, hey, that's a person. I can invite them to come to church with me next Sunday. Or, uh, or someone you know that they are without Christ. That You say, hey, I, Lord, I'm going to, I want them to be the, the one that you put upon my heart. And so, you know, you're going to make a commitment to begin to pray. Now, we'll have an invitation. We still got a few minutes before we get to that. But an invitation. And in that invitation, maybe it's God, you're a believer in Christ, and God has put someone on your heart. Maybe the invitation is to want to come forward and kind of just say, hey, Lord, here's so-and-so, cousin, family member, uh, co-worker, acquaintance, or it's that guy that uh, works at the uh, gas station or whatever, or girl. Or, and, and say, Lord, you know, I want to begin to pray. Then I'll pray God will stir uh, their heart. I, I want to pray, God, that we can get into a gospel conversation like that. Or just pray, Lord, give me courage to say, hey, do you have a church you go to? Uh, we live in a post-Christian society. I don't know if you realize that or not. There's a lot of unchurched folks out there. And if you invite them, guess what? They will come. A lot of them will. And so, you know, what I want us to do in the next couple of weeks as we study through this passage is really just allow God to put someone on your heart, man, and begin to pray for them, begin to uh, invite them to come. Now, the passage that we're going to look at today is a passage where just for the day, and, and, and so there's a lot kind of stuffed into this passage, but this is really concerning what's known as the doctrine of hell. Sometimes folks come to me and they say, man, you're like that hell, fire, brimstone passage and, and, or preacher. And what I say is, uh, well, I'm not the one who wrote this passage. God did, and he, he brings us up. This is a this is a topic that's not very palatable in the United States of America. If you ask about a poll research, 2014, went out and interviewed people, 74% of people believe in heaven, 58% of people believe in hell, but only 5% of people who believe in hell believe they're actually going to that place called hell. Now, as we get into this passage, I want to share with you about when we talk about who's, who's your one is that the end really matters. We're, we're talking about something here in the, in the lives of people where uh, heaven and hell are, are hanging out here. And I, I really believe that God wants to do something. I believe he wants to do something special and a great work in America. Do you realize that we need a great awakening in America today? Come on, amen. I don't know if you've ever studied history and that kind of stuff, but we need a great awakening. We need the revival of God to move across uh, our nation or, or we're going to get a rude awakening. You know, and I believe God, and, and we see the Scripture, He wants to see people come to Him, but he, he has chosen to work through believers in Him to see that come about. So what I'm asking you to do is begin to think about who's the one that God's put upon your heart, and the end matters, and that's why we've chosen specifically to teach through this passage that it deals kind of the doctrine, the theology of hell, and what is coming at the end. Would you stand with me for that? Uh, public reading of the scripture here, Luke chapter 16. I'm going to pick up in verse 19. Follow along. Whether you have your phone or you have one of the outlines that were out by the door. Here we go. Now there was a rich man. This is Jesus telling the story. He's a rich man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table besides even the dogs. Now this is pretty gross. Even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, which the idea he goes to heaven. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, which is the idea of hell, the place called hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I'm in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, child. Now, that's a word of compassion. I mean, this idea, man, Jesus loves people. And, and so anyway, we're, we're going to get into that. But he says, child, remember 
that during your life you received the good things and likewise Lazarus the bad things, but now he's being comforted here and you're in agony. Besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm fixed, which means it can't change. So that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to, to us. Then he said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Verse 31, but he said to them, they do not listen to Moses and the prophets. They will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Let's pray. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. We say thank you. Lord, we are privileged to hear the teaching of your word this morning, to read your word out loud, to have a Bible, whether if it's by phone or, or in our hands and paper or, Lord, just privileged. And we say thank you. We, we are blessed beyond measure. I pray we don't take the next few minutes for granted. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, you speak to us. Lord, I know there are believers that are here, those who are born again, but I know also there are unbelievers that are here. There are those who know about you just like I did. Lord, at one time, they don't know you personally. And I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray today you'll save someone. So, Lord, I pray for believers, man, put upon our heart the person to invite, the person to begin to just invest in, to share with, to have a gospel conversation with. Lord, uh, I pray you would do that. And so, Lord, as we spend the next few minutes together, I, I pray we exalt you, Jesus, and lift you up. And I know you will draw people unto yourself. We pray this in your name, the name of Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen, amen. Please be seated if you would. You know, if you ask people their opinion, I know you may not just say, I'm going to go to the coffee shop in the morning and get in a conversation about hell. I know you, you may not desire to do that, but if you're going to ask people uh, about the subject of the place called hell, if you ask a child that, uh, you may say, where's heaven? They point up. You say, where is hell? They usually, if they have a church background, they point down and you may ask the question like, well, who is in that place called hell? And a lot of times the child will go, that's the devil, okay, the devil, Satan. Well, theologically, the devil doctrinally is not there yet, okay? But hell is a place that the Bible tells us has been reserved for Satan and his angels, those fallen angels who were all uh, kicked uh, out of heaven. And so we, we know that. If you were to uh, ask a Mormon, say, well, what do you believe about hell? hell, uh, they will say, well, as a Mormon, they believe when a Mormon dies, that you may become an angel or God yourself and be the God of a planet somewhere. Okay, that's Mormonism. They also say then there's another planet reserved kind of for folks in the middle, and then there's another planet that's uh, reserved for uh, the wicked. Okay, well, that's their idea of what they say hell is. If you were to ask Jehovah's Witness, what about hell? They say, well, there's no hell. It's just complete annihilation. If you were to ask uh, a follower of Christ uh, who may not, maybe they haven't studied the Scripture, they may say, yeah, there's a hell. I don't know a whole lot about it. Well, the Bible has, a, has quite a bit to say about it. And again, it's not something that's very palatable or even politically correct to talk about in our culture, but it is a literal place that Christ has prepared. I remember my, uh, I always said, I know I smile because I just thought about this. Man, I can remember my systematic theology professor in seminary. He looked at us out there. Now, you got to remember in seminary, the average age is 34. We had folks all across the board who were there. Me, out of agriculture. I mean, I didn't even know where places were on the map, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I didn't pay attention. And, uh, but he said, God is the God of heaven. And we're like, yeah. And he said, and God is also the God of hell. It was total silence in the room. He said, you boys don't understand. He said, Jesus. And the scripture says, he said, it's better to fear the one who sends that, who, who has control, but who can punish in this place called hell. I mean, a lot of times we think about it, you have to understand it. In Revelations, the Bible tells us that Satan and the angels, it talks about eternal torment in the presence of the angels of God and of Christ the Lamb. God is the God of heaven. He's the God of hell. Now, here is some facts about this place called hell. And I'm going to say this before we kind of begin to work through this passage, but a few facts here is that uh, hell, as I said, it's been, 
It's been made for the devil. In fact, let me just give this to you. If you got your Bible, uh, flip over to Matthew real quick. Matthew, and I want you to turn to uh, chapter 25. If you got your phone, use that. Matthew 25, and there in verse uh, 41, uh, here's what it says. It says, then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil uh, and for his angels. But the Bible also tells us in Ezekiel 33, chapter 11, the Bible says this. It says that the Lord does not take pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Now, when you talk about the doctrine of hell and the theology of hell, you have to understand it is a place that has been prepared for Satan uh, and his angels, okay? It's a place of, we're going to talk about eternal torment, uh, etern eternal separation, and eternal justice, okay? But we also understand that the Lord does not take pleasure and the destruction of the wicked. So when you look at this place called hell and you think about this, the Lord is willing that all should come to uh, faith in him, that people should come to him in repentance. He's desiring for all people to be saved. I can remember, I've shared this illustration before. When I was speaking with a guy, uh, a farmer, he was a tough guy, and he was just very, I mean, very, uh, if we say uh, uh, bold in this, he said, I'm not going to serve uh, this God who does this, and I'm not going to serve this God uh, who does that. And he said this comment uh, to me. He said, I'm not going to serve a God who sends people to hell. And I looked at him, came out of my mouth. I said, God's not sending you to hell. You're sending yourself because you're rejecting the Savior of the universe. You know, when uh, I was just in a place on the Kenya border, and we just got back in Friday night, and and, you know, I look out there in, in some of those countries in Africa, and uh, uh, we, we, you see there's a lot of hardships. And, uh, I mean, hey, please understand, when you turn the water on in your house, you know, you flip the, you know, you turn the knob, and water comes out. The next time you do that, would you just say, thank you, Jesus, for running water? I mean, really. You realize most of the world does not live like we do. But sometimes when you're out like that and, and we're out there and we're sharing the, the gospel of Jesus or preaching and uh, I think Dr. Huff said, you know, gave out like 400 mama kits for pregnant ladies that, so they got uh, a razor blade to cut the umbilical cord that's sterile and they have uh, a plastic sheet they can put down when they had their baby, gave out a lot of those. Uh, I think he said uh, we were able to, maybe we had a little health clinic going on, ministered like 500 people or something and treated like 1,200 and some odd animals. That's a lot of goats and cows, by the way, you know. And then the, uh, preaching the gospel and this stuff. But, but you know, you get out there and uh, you're, you're kind of like we call in the middle of nowhere sometimes. And uh, you look around and it's a, usually a different season for what it is here in America and different time zones and all that kind of stuff. And you think about these folks out here, the, uh, the Maasai who are coming through with their cattle, and they got kind of the, the robe around them, and they're young boys, and they're fighting snakes and all that kind of stuff, and they're driving these cattle. And you think about it. You know the Bible says in Romans 1 that man is without excuse? Do you hear me on this? Man is without excuse. It says general revelation, they can look up, and through the creation of God, they know there is a God. So when you're sitting and you're thinking about this doctrine called hell, and it's a place of eternal torment, it's a place of eternal separation and isolation, it's a place of eternal adjustment, justice. And when you think across the world about folks, you say, what about someone who's never heard uh, of the Lord Jesus? Whenever that thought comes to your mind, number one, you always say, thank you, Jesus. I was born where I, I heard the gospel of Christ. And, and if you're saved and born again, say, Lord Jesus, thank you that I'm able to respond to this. But also that the Bible tells us in Romans 1, it says, man, it's not an excuse. You can go. So you can go back to Acts 10 and look at Cornelius, who was called a God-fearing man, was not a follower of Jesus, was a God-fearing man. And God goes and gets Peter and sends Peter to Cornelius to preach the gospel. And the Bible tells us that Cornelius got gloriously saved. Amen? Now, when I say that, so when you think about, because sometimes people, we talk about this place called hell, just like that farmer, he said, I am not going to serve a God that does this, does this, does this. Hell is a place that is reserved for Satan and his angels, but also for those who reject the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, it's wherever, it's wherever you live. So uh, I'm preaching in a church last Sunday, and it's on the uh, top of a mountain called Mount Elgon. Very, very beautiful. Very, I don't know, 8,000 foot or something. It was kind of high elevation for me. And it's just wonderful. I mean, you can see, I kept telling people, I said, we live where it's flat, you know, and, and uh, on this mountain. And uh, 
So uh, when you're preaching through a translator, too, you give the invitation, uh, you know, you're saying something, and they're just looking at the translator, and they're like, oh, you know, get that. So we get to the invitation, and, and I'm thinking the invitation. I thought, this is not going. I don't know if I'm not communicating well. So finally, I said, okay, let's just stop, you know. And uh, they quit singing. I said, is, is there anybody here that would like me? I know I'm the guy from America or whatever. I got a translator. I don't speak the language. But, man, I can just pray for you. And so... Uh, 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 the guy goes through that, and people start coming. And, uh, and I, I told the guy, I said, you need to ask them, are they born again? And then what are they want to pray for? So, man, there's folks coming, and, and you see, yeah. And then uh, there were a couple of people came up, and uh, they, I said, uh, he talks to me, he looks at me, and he said, they're ready to be saved right now. Hey, for a preacher, you're like, oh, Lord, you're so good, right? Come on, amen. Isn't that what we want to see happen today? Don't you want to see somebody get gloriously saved today? Hey, because the end matters. There's also a lady who uh, came forward and he said, she wants you to pray. She's sick. I said, yeah, I'll pray. He said, but she's not born again. I said, is she ready to get born again? He said, no, she does not want to be born again. But she wants you to pray for her. Now, here's just a few things about hell. When we talk about hell, this is kind of the first point that you see there, just biblical truth. Hell is a place of torment. This torment, I know we, we, you can read a lot in here. This place of torment is a place of awareness. It's a place of awareness. Here's the sad, this is where, this is the facts of today. This happens all the time. There's somebody here. Now, my prayer is, I mean, I pray you get gloriously saved. But usually there's somebody here going, hey, man, I wish you'd hurry up so I can get out of here. I wish you'd hurry up. You're not keeping my attention. You know, uh, I'm just here because I'm here with this girl. And come on, get your stuff done. Let me go because I'm all about her and I won't go eat. You're rejecting Jesus, what you've done. Okay. That woman who came forward last Sunday, I pray she's back there today. I pray there was seeds of the gospel sown. But if she died... Between last Sunday and today, for all eternity, she will remember that dude that came from that place called Jonesboro, Arkansas, who preached the gospel, and she told him to his face that she didn't want to be born again. That's awareness. That's why it's called that place uh, of torment. It's just awareness, and it's awareness of the rejection. Think about how many of you heard the gospel of Jesus before you ever responded to that? Now, I know when we talk about this, man, I don't want to talk about that. I, that's just that's tough. I want you to know, man, Jesus loves you. Man, and he cares for you. But sin cannot enter into heaven. And Jesus came and died on the cross. And I'm telling you, for those who are believers in Christ, uh, you just got to say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, that God stepped in and, and saved me. Do you, do you realize that Jesus said himself, if you've, uh, if you've got, the, if you got a Bible with you, uh, turn over to Matthew 7 real quick. I just want to share something else with you. Matthew 7. This is... It's sad, but it's the words of Christ on the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's the longest sermon preached by the greatest preacher ever lived. His name is Jesus. Amen? And uh, but there's just so much in there. And, I mean, so much. You can just you spend months, years, whatever. But in Matthew 7, verse 13, he said, Enter through the narrow gate. This is in Matthew 7, 13. Through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, if you just take that, this is the words of Christ. Longest sermon preached by the greatest preacher who ever lived. His name is Jesus, teaching people and the disciples. And he said, here's the deal. He said, there's a big gate, big enough to drive a big Mack truck through, and it's a six-lane highway that leads to destruction. There's a whole lot of folks on it. But then there's this narrow gate. It's not very wide. I don't know if you can fit a car through it. And it's a one-lane road. And it leads to life, and there are few who find it. What, what you say, what's Jesus saying? The majority of people are on the highway that's headed to hell. I want you to think about that for just a moment. And so, as a believer, this is why there will be many times I'll just be doing something, and I'm like, thank you, Jesus, because I was on that highway, that six-lane highway with a whole bunch of other people who are my Baptist buddies 
that we were all in it together, and we were always about, well, at least things bad as you are, or that kind of stuff. I mean, that's the kind of life that we live. We were on a six-lane highway with big gates driving a Mack truck through it that leads to the place of destruction. You see, it is a, it's in a place of a awareness. It's a place of the fire. And here's the thing, this, uh, this uh, guy who was dressed in purple, and, and he had a lot of wealth and this kind of stuff, but I want you to think about it. The, the guy who was sitting at the gate named Lazarus, now please remember, this is not Lazarus from John 11. This is not Lazarus that was raised from a dead, who ended up dying again, by the way, that Jesus caught him out of the tomb, you know, and he came forward and Jesus said, unbind him, let him go. This, this is not the same guy, but this guy's name is Lazarus, and it, it, he's suffering and he has sores on him that the dogs come and lick. I mean, if you don't, I don't know how he could get worse than that. It's just bad. But it's the idea in the context that day after day after day, he sits at the gate of this rich man. Now, you may think, well, I can't believe the rich man would do it. But think about this. This rich man was religious. So picture this. If you were to go home today, and I don't know where you all live, but maybe you got a mailbox out there. Angel and I got a mailbox. And you turn in to our house. And, uh, or maybe you have a driveway, you have a tree right there where you turn in. And if you go and there's some guy or lady who's sitting there, maybe they're very poor. Maybe they've got disease about their body. And it's so bad that the neighborhood dogs are there. I mean, that's bad. And uh, what would you do? Now, I would say, some of you are like, man, we need to call the ambulance. We need to get them to the ER. They need to get some medical treatment. Uh, we, you know, we need to get them some food. Maybe we call like Salvation Army or something, you know. See if they got a place to stay or something like that. You say, man, the rich man, why didn't he do that? Let me tell you what the rich man did. He was religious. He let him sit there at his mailbox day after day after day. Would you do that? Would I do that? You pull in every day. Oh, there's that guy. The dogs are licking his body. We just let him there. You, you see, he, this rich man was very religious in this, you know, because he let him stay right there in his front yard. So, the Bible tells us that he is able to, he's aware, he remembers, it mentions fire, it mentions thirst. We know it's a place prepared for Satan and his angels. It's a place of great, great white throne judgment that says, if your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. We know that. And it's a place of, it's a place of choice. You say, aren't you trying to scare me? No, I, I'm no, I don't want to scare you. Because you can get scared and still not have a personal relationship with Jesus. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to give you facts. And for two reasons. There's some of you here today, you need to receive Jesus. You're not saved. You're not born again. I was sitting in, in Tebby, uh, what's the day Sunday? Day Sunday, okay. Uh, sitting in Tebby Thursday night. And, and, and we had come in on a mission, mission aviation plane, prop plane, and we landed, and so we got to go stay at this uh, little hotel for just a few hours before we flew out at midnight. Night. And so I'm sitting there, and uh, I'm, I'm out in the lobby because I'm on Wi-Fi. And so I'm, I'm going through text and email and stuff, and the lady's sitting up here at the counter, the African lady. And she says, what are you people doing? That was her. She didn't say, hey, how are you? Like, what are you people doing? And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what this is, but okay. And uh, I said, well, here's what we're doing. And, uh, and I said, we're working with pastors, and we're helping plant churches, you know. And she kept going. She said, and she, she got this real, she said, are you planting born-again churches? I'm like, yes, ma'am. She's like, good, you know. I said, are you born again? Yes, I'm born again. Now, I, I bring that up and, and share that with you because, uh, there's some of you here who need to be saved. You need to be born again. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you not see the kingdom of God. Because the end matters. So there's some who need to be saved. And there are others here. Hey, look, let me just be honest with you. You're wasting your time on this earth. That's what you're doing. You're wasting time. Now you say, you want me to quit my job? I didn't tell you to quit your job. Don't go out here and say, Brother Archie, tell me to quit my job. Okay, you don't do that unless God tells you to do that. But make the most of what God has given you. And what I mean by that, you may be a teacher, you may work, you have acquaintances. I'm telling you, you can begin to pray. If we want to see a great awakening coming, it's going to come through prayer. And you need to get in prayer. You need to ask God, put on my heart, who is that one? And to have that conversation, just invite folks to come to church. If you go up to somebody and say, hey, man, I want to invite you to come to church. We live in a post-Christian society. There's a lot of lost people running around everywhere. A lot of them will go, yeah, man, I'll come. 
You know, God's already stirring and drawing and stuff's going on in their lives. So you just ask them. Uh, they'll come. You'll get into some conversations, man, with them about life and, and that kind of stuff and things that are happening and taking place. So for those who are believers, I'm just asking you, man, encourage you. F figure out who's that one. So we have this invitation. Just a little bit, a few minutes. You may want to come and just kind of put their, their, their name down on the altar and say, Lord, give me strength to pray for them. Give me strength to, man, the boldness just to, to invite them. And God, I want to see you do a great work. So it's a place of torment. It's a place of a separation. You know, there in the passage, Abraham tells him, he says, there's a great chasm that's fixed between us. Okay, you can't go uh, back and forth. The separation is, uh, it's not annihilation. This eternal separation is not reincarnation. Uh, you know, it is, a, it is isolation is what it is. I remember, uh, I hope you never said this, but when um, in my dumbness, if we'll call it this, I, I was not, I knew about Jesus, but did not know him personally. But I made a statement a couple of different times. There'd be something brought up about the place called hell. And here's what I'd say. Well, you know what? At least I'll be there with all my friends. I would say stuff like that. And you say, Archie, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I am ashamed I said that. You say, I can't believe you're a preacher. And I've always been a preacher and I've always been saved. I don't know about you and your life, but I made a lot of mistakes. And I think my buddy's going to be, when it talks about isolation, this is not like, this is not the John Wayne movie in a saloon, all the cowboys with bad hats and the bad people sitting around drinking beer and whiskey and having a good time for eternity. It is a place of isolation. It is a place of separation that we see. And there's a great chasm. It's fixed. It is, when it says fixed, it means it's an endless age that continues. So it is that place of torment. It's that place of isolation. But it's also that, it's that place of uh, justice. And he says, the rich man says, okay, then send uh, Lazarus back, okay? Because if he comes back from the dead, and I got these five brothers, then they're going to believe in him. And, and Abraham said, no, they got Moses and the prophets. They've got the Old Testament. They got the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. If they will not believe in the Old Testament and Moses and the prophets, they will not believe even if a man comes back from the dead. And you say, man, I'm here. If I saw somebody come back from the dead, I'd believe. No, probably not. Because the Bible tells us in the other Lazarus, the other, with the other Lazarus, it says that when Lazarus came forth, from, I love that passage. Man, I love that story. Hey, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes out in the grave clothes. I'm buying him, let him go. It says many people were there and they saw it and believed. But the Bible also tells us that there were many who were there who saw it, who did not believe, and they go back and they begin to tell the Pharisees, tell the Jews what have happened. So can you remember eyewitness? Hey, I was there. This dude named Lazarus, not the Lazarus here in this passage. This dude named Lazarus, they, man, he'd been dead four days. And then Jesus shows up and they roll the stone away. And one of the sisters says, man, don't do that because his body's decaying. It's going to be, it's bad. And he says, hey, come out of there. And this guy comes out wrapped in gray clothes. Hey, and I knew him and that was him. They unwrapped him and that was Lazarus. Okay. He's back telling Jews. And the Bible tells us that the Jews, they didn't say, oh, we believe. No, they conspired to kill Jesus from that day. Then the Bible also tells us that people who knew that Lazarus, the other Lazarus, they'd been raised from the dead. You go back and read in the Gospels. It tells us that there were people, they wanted to kill him because people were believing in Jesus because of the resurrection of Lazarus. They wanted to kill him. No, 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 no. You say, somebody come back from the dead, I'd believe. No, not necessarily. You see, there's the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the power of the gospel, amen? It's the gospel story, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where the Holy Spirit brings conviction uh, of sin. This is where, uh, regardless, if it's around the world, whatever, people walk out and they look around, okay? It says no one is with a, has an excuse. They look around and there's a general revelation of God. Now, you can only be saved through the special revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel. That's why, man, when we take an offering, and I tell you, we're, we're taking this offering is for the spread of the gospel. There are missionaries who go out. We go out. We're all sent. And by the way, I say, praise the Lord, Arkansas State, last night, great game. I go to bed. You said, you just diverted a whole nother path. Yep, I got to tell you a story. I go to bed, and Angie's listening to Matt on the phone, real loud, and I go to sleep. And the first thing this morning, I wake up, she says, A State won. So I just throw that in there. <laughs> now, here's where I was going with that. The world has come to the doorstep of Jonesboro. The world is at the doorstep of Jonesboro. There's international students from all over the world. It is the power 
of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord Jesus wants to see people saved. The Lord Jesus has chosen to work through you and I to see that happen. This place called hell is a real place. It's the place of eternal torment, eternal separation, and eternal justice. And it's right here. You know, it, it's kind of, sometimes people say, well, well, let's just do something. I say some. It, it's sometimes of a joke or whatever. But, well, let me just back up. Sometimes what happens in the church is people try to manifest the presence of God. So they say, man, if we get like a smoke machine, uh, nothing wrong with smoke machines. If we get a smoke machine, people think it's a kind of glory of God, you know. And I've read in some church history, there's some people who did some very bad stuff wrong ways trying to manipulate people. Folks, this is not a manipulation. This is what the Lord God Almighty said. Jesus himself said the road is broad and the gate is wide that leads to destruction. But this is narrow. Yes, there are few who find it. You may be here today. It's where it comes to point of invitation. If the Holy Spirit is stirring your heart, it is a privilege for that to happen. It's a privilege uh, for that to happen. And so I, I beg you, I use a word the Bible uses, Paul used it, implore you to not reject Jesus. We're not guaranteed of next week. We're not guaranteed of tomorrow. And you say, well, hey, I'll be back here next Sunday. And if God's stirring my heart, then I'll get saved then. You're not guaranteed of that. And I mean, this guy, yes, he was, he's very wealthy. There's nothing wrong with, man, he, he probably worked very hard, had a bunch of stuff and he was religious, but he had rejected God and he spent an eternity separated from him. And, and so there's just this memory of that and he knows that and it's a place of torment. I implore you to repent of sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus. And if God's stirring your heart, then don't reject that. Don't, don't walk out of here, man. Receive what the Lord's doing. So when we stand here in a minute and we pray, maybe you're here. And you say, man, that's me. I know I need a Savior. I need forgiveness of sin. I invite you to come. And I invite you to come. One of the pastors, one of the deacons say, hey, today, you know, today I'm surrendering my life to Christ. And you may just be honest and say, I really don't know what all that means. I just know and believe that he died on the cross for my sins and that I've repented of my sin. And the Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so I'm surrendering myself to him. I want him to take control of my life. And uh, man, I, I, I'm ready. I want him saving me today. And I say, praise God, hallelujah, okay? But so it, it's so easy for that enemy because Satan is, I mean, hell is reserved for that place of Satan and his angel. angel. so easy for that enemy to say, hey, man, not today, not today. So I implore you, I ask you, man, don't reject him today, okay? But then there's also those here believers and out there in refuge in the service that, I mean, who's your one? Let's don't waste our lives, okay? Hey, we're going to work hard. Come on, amen? We're going to work hard. We're going to provide for our families. We're going to. You know, if you get an education, I'm like, come on, you know, whatever you do, we're going to work at. Whatever you do, do for the Lord. Uh, but who's your one? Who's that person God has put on your heart to pray? And would you just, man, make a commitment to begin to pray for that person, to begin to have a conversation with them? Yes, man, I'm just nervous about it. Let's invite them to church and just see what happens. They say, I want you to come to church next Sunday. Or I'll meet you at this service I go to. Because I really believe if we do that, and we see this in Scripture, if we do that, I mean, God is, he'll move through that. And why he's chosen to work through us, I really don't understand that. But that's how he set this thing up. Okay, so we're going to have the invitation. It's a place of response. It's a place of prayer. And you may be here and you say, man, I just want somebody to pray for me. We want to do that this morning. I don't know what's taking place in your life. I don't know what's going on. But there'll be some pastors here, some deacons here, be some men here, be some ladies here, pray with the ladies I just encourage you to respond to him here and out in refuge. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I know that we, we look into your word and uh, we talk about this place called eternal torment, eternal separation, <laughs> eternal justice. And Lord, we look at that and we think, man, that's, that's something. But Lord Jesus, you came and died on that cross for our sins. You came that we might have life. You came that we would have forgiveness. And so, Lord, I just speak on behalf of all the believers in the room. We just say, thank you, Jesus. 
But then, Lord, I also know there are those that may be some here today who are, Lord, the balance is hanging there, heaven and hell. Lord, I pray that no one could reject you today. Oh, Lord, your grace is and good, and you love us. And so, Lord, I pray we respond this morning, here and out in refuge, respond. Someone for salvation, someone this may be a recommitment of their life to you, someone just praying for a friend, an acquaintance member, or who's the one, but, Lord, that we just respond to you this morning. It's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, please.